Kaveri Madhavan was born in India and moved to Ireland 33 years ago, arriving on Valentine's Day. And despite the Irish weather, has been in love with the country ever since. So Kaveri is the author of three books of fiction, um, Paddy Indian, The Uncoupling, and the one we're going to talk about today, the fantastic um, The Tainted. She writes opinion pieces for the Irish Times and wrote a Saturday column for the Evening Herald for seven years and has also contributed to the Sunday Tribune, The Phoenix, and Travel Extra. So she is currently working on her fourth novel um, and lives with her husband and three children in County Kildare. So I think we should just give her a warm welcome. Oh, well. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you. <laughs> So, how does it feel to be at a real live event? Because your book was actually published during lockdown, wasn't it? So, yeah. Tell us a little. Uh, it's absolutely wonderful to be to be here at this particular uh, festival because you know the Tainted was written almost entirely written in in Glengariff, and uh, so it's, uh, for me it's a very sort of emotional, sentimental thing. When when Ima invited me to be part of it, I was just over the moon more than I would have been for any other festival. <laughs> And can you please tell us a little bit about your shirt? This is very important. <laughs> <laughs> and it really needs to be centre stage, yes. I promise you. And it, it is relevant, I promise. Yeah. <laughs> well, just before COVID hit, um, you know, in March of last year, I was in India, uh, um, sort of for events in India and related to the book. And I knew that I was coming back to Ireland for my book launch. And I just had this got this into my head that I needed a th tiger themed shirt and t dresses to wear and I searched the whole of India for something with the tiger print on it you know and then of course came to lockdown and 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 the, everything all the tiger th themed things remained in in my wardrobe until today so here I am <laughs> <laughs> and my, my children sort of gave me so much of stick you know they said mom you're just literally you know you're taking it a bit too far too too literary <laughs> They don't understand, yeah. <laughs> so I think, if you don't mind, I'd love to start with the, um, the title, okay? Because the title, I mean, mm. the cover is just stunning, um, and that really attracted me. But the title, I thought, was fantastic. Um, can you tell us a little about, bit about the title? Because I think it got you in trouble as well, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, um, well, to tell you about, just to explain the title, you know, the, the book is about three different groups of people, all tainted by association. So, you know, the, the mixed-race Anglo-Indian community in India tainted by them, the fact that they were mixed race. Uh, you know, Anglo-Irish people tainted by the fact that you know, they, were, they were never fully English, never fully Irish in, in other people's minds, not, not in their minds, you know. Uh, and then, of course, the, the Irish Catholic soldiers who served the crown, uh, you know, at the very same time that when Ireland was fighting for her own freedom, and they were also tainted by the fact that they had taken the king's shilling, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's why I, I decided to call the book The Tainted. But when I was in India at that time, um, as I, I was saying, you know, just before COVID, uh, I was at, a, at an event in the University of Madras, which is my, which is my alma mater. And I was sitting beside a, a, a woman who, who asked me, what are you here for? And I said, oh, I'm, I'm here because you know, I'm reading for my book, The Tainted. And I explained it to her briefly. And she was so annoyed. She said, well, I really take objection to that name because I'm Anglo-Indian. And you know, it, it, I was quite sort of taken aback and then I persuaded her, I gave her a copy, I gave her the copy of my book and I said to her, you know, I want, uh, please read it. Uh, you know, you're Anglo-Indian, you're the first Anglo-Indian that I've known to have read the book, so please read it. And she, she called me back about a week later and it was absolutely, you know, so happy. She said, yeah. you know, that it's the first time somebody has written a book that didn't look down on us, uh, didn't have pity for us. Mm. Uh, but just told it as it is. So mm. I was really, really, really happy. That Actually, that one endorsement mm. really made me confident about the book. Oh, and that must yeah. have felt such a relief. For you yeah, as absolutely. Well. Yeah. 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 Um, because as well, you know, but it, I, what really struck me in the book is there's so much empathy and pathos, but it really is very, like you say, it just tells it as it is. You know, there's no... We, we get to see very much other people's um, prejudices and expectations, mm -hmm. but never once, you know, feel it from you. And it's just such a beautiful, um, epic sweep Thank of you. the time. It's a beautiful book. So, um, whereabouts, like, when did you 
find the title, I'm, I'm intrigued by titles because I think they're really hard or I find them very hard. Um, and for me, it's usually the last thing. Like, I can be two weeks before being published and they're like, you really need the title. Um, yeah. <laughs> so for you, because you've had three books now, um, and I don't know if it's a pattern, but whereabouts did the title come? And where did yeah, at the very start, Elizabeth. Because, really? Yeah, at the very start, wow. because I was actually, when I started the book, it was to be the story of the, the, it was to be, the, you know, as close as possible, a fictionalized version, uh, or rather fictionalized telling of the story of the Connacht Rangers. Um, so, you know, from the start, I knew that this was a group of soldiers who, who were tainted mm. by association. So it started with that. And then, you know, as I researched the book within, not so much as when I re researched the book, but when I started writing the book, mm. um, I kind of realized that the bigger story was, you know, the, the Anglo-Indian story, I yeah. felt then was the bigger story. So, you know, the, the focus moved away from um, the, the mutiny and what happened, the aftermath of the mutiny, to the soldiers. You know, it moved away to the, more to the Anglo-Indian community. Mm. Uh, and, and, of course, during the research as well, you know, the, the revelation for me that a lot of the officers were Anglo-Irish in Irish regiments. Mm. Um, uh, you know, they were also caught in limbo when they came back. Yeah. you know, from, from India to, to, to free Ireland. Yeah. So, you know. And you do get a real strong sense of that, like liminal spaces that mm. people mm. exist mm. within. Mm. Um, and where did the spark of this idea come from? Did I, did I hear somewhere that it was from an overhead conversation or yeah. something? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was um, quite ashamed to say that I, I actually didn't know <laughs> that, that so many Irish regiments mm. served in India. Uh, that's something I didn't know until I started researching this book. And it was an overheard conversation in, in, uh, in the Indian Embassy. Uh, I was invited to, uh, to an event in the Indian Embassy and just literally overheard a conversation about how the Irish flag inspired the Indian flag. Oh. You know, because the colors are very similar, but well, not very similar, identical nearly. And um, in that conversation, they said, oh, you know, the, the first time the Irish uh, trekler was raised outside Ireland was in India at, at the time of the mutiny. You know, the Union oh. Jack was pulled down and the Irish trekler was, um, was uh, sort of flown, um, stitched together from pieces of silk that the uh, soldiers had bought in the bazaar. Oh. And apparently that, uh, you know, inspired Indian freedom fighters. Mm. Now, how far that story is true, I, I don't know. I mean, it's obviously not, uh, not authenticated. But I think we'd like to claim that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think absolutely. we'd like to claim that yeah. as real. <laughs> but I mean, but I didn't realize how much either until, you know, until I read your book, because it's not something that's really, um, you know, it's not really covered much in like fiction at all. I think this is the first novel. I think there's a few films, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. So there's a, a gap, I think, of coverage, so I think a lot of people will be learning about it for the first time from reading yeah, this book. Yeah, I mean, and, and even in film, I think it was more, it was not so much the Irish connection in India as much as, um, as, much as the Indian connection in India, sorry, the, as much as the English connection in India, you know, that was, uh, would you like me to wait? Okay. Yeah. Walk away. Yeah. Okay. You're fine. Okay. You so, I mean, if, uh, if anybody, if you, if you enjoyed the book and you want, to re, uh, you want to watch a film, I would really highly recommend watching an old film uh, called Bhavani Junction, uh, a fabulous old film with, um, oh, the, the name now escapes me, two, fun, two amazing old, old style Hollywood actors and actresses. And, uh, it's a f fantastic, fantastic film, you know. Um, Rita, I think it had Rita Hayworth, I think, was the star of that. So, yeah, lovely, lovely, lovely movie, Bhavani Junction. Mm -hmm. So I always think of, like, writers as, you know, scavengers. You know, we're always actively seeking. Um, and this idea came from an um, overheard, I uh, overheard conversation. Mm, mm. Now, I mean, we can always hear lots and lots of ideas. I don't know if you're the same, but you collect lots of ideas. But how do you know when a book is something that you really want to write? How do you know that that's the story that you have to... Yeah, I, I literally knew it the very, the very next day when I came back that night. And the next day started looking, you know, it was the early days of Google, and but whatever little was available online, I knew straight away this was a story that needed to be told. I, my next door neighbor, my best friend, um, you know, also big into reading, and I asked her, I said, did you know, but do you know of this? And she said, no, never heard of. And I just thought, okay, if, if a well-read Irish person has never heard of, of yeah. the Irish uh, military involvement in mm. the Raj, then this needs to be told, you know. Okay. So, so I mean, it, it's, it's a well-researched subject in academia, 
you know, historians have written so much, and and I owe like everything to all the historians who who um, you know who have written and researched about Irish people in India, because mm -hmm. that's I gleaned all my information for the book. Yeah, uh, I mean, you know, through through that, you know, through re through reading the work of historians. I can tell that you did a lot of research, like you know. Yeah. Not, you know, I mean, it, it's totally woven, woven into the story beautifully. So, you know, but um, there's no way you could have written this story without really, um, yeah, it's you one, know. It's one of the reasons it took so long to write, because I, yeah. n not because I researched it so much, because I actually just loved the research so much. It was <laughs> such fun, you know, to, to watch movies and immerse yourself in, <laughs> in, in other people's fiction and then claim it was research. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so a good few years passed by just enjoying myself, you know, um, but it was interesting because a lot of my research was sort of done laterally, you know, mm. through things that you wouldn't think would be relevant to the book. Um, and one of them was definitely, you know, to, to bring in the, the, the regimental chaplain, mm. you know, and weave him into the story was definitely came because I, when I researched uh, the life of soldiers in India, I realized how much military chaplains, uh, you know, what a huge role they had um, in, you know, in the lives of the soldiers when they're outside Ireland. Um, I just wanted to, I'm going to ask you to read in a moment if you'd be happy to do that. But first of all, because you mentioned um, about the book taking a long time. So can you, <laughs> you know what, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, the journey to um, the public, well, the writing of and publication of The Tainted? Yeah, well, well I, I kind of, I motored along for the first two years writing away. And then unfortunately, um, you know, the, the financial crash happened and my, my publishers who, who published my first two books uh, went under. And that kind of just left me bereft, you know. I thought, oh my mm. God, now who's ever going to publish me, you know. Uh, because it is hard enough. Um, it is all pre-Twitter and pre, you know, where you could sort of try and, you know, garner some attention for yourself. It was, it was impossible to do. Mm. Um, so I, I kind of um, I languished a little bit and then I had, um, I ha unfortunately had a stroke, mm -hmm. um, and it happened here in Glengarriff. <laughs> so, uh, you know, so that set me back a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and then, and then I, I got back to writing again, uh, you know, chugged along, researching it, writing it. Um, and very luckily for me, um, my, my, the publishers, my previous book came back, uh, came back into, into sort of, um, into publishing again under a different name, and uh, when I approached them, they said, yeah, we'll, we'll go with it. And oh, fantastic. So here so, I am. <laughs> so was it eight, 18 years to write yeah, the book in total? Yeah, yeah in total, so yeah, yeah. 18 years' work. And then yeah. we go and gobble it up in two days. <laughs> Do you know, we're just, we're just terrible humans. It really, really is. <laughs> Would you like to share, uh, read yeah, some absolutely. for us? Yeah, I think we'd yeah. like to hear so some. So the, the, the little section that I'm going to read, I'm just only, go only going to read a page and a half, um, is... Um, my young soldier, his name is Michael Flaherty, and he is, um, he's just met, he's met this, this young Anglo-Indian girl, and, um, hold on a minute, let me just get the page right, oh yeah, here we are, and he's actually just thinking about their relationship, um, and you know, how, how much trouble it's going to get him into. So his name is Michael. Michael knew that he would never be given permission to marry her. The military rules were strict and clear. Marriage for young soldiers was forbidden. It was difficult enough for senior NCOs who were considered very fortunate if they managed to put their wives and children on the regimental books. There was always a scramble for that privilege, despite the fact that married soldiers led a very hard life with very cramped quarters and little or no social facilities. What's more, Michael had signed on for seven years with the Colours, with a regiment that could be sent to any part of the empire at any time. Seven years before he could ask permission to marry, no wonder the lads in B Company thought him a bloody fool to have got tangled up with the Baconwala's daughter. He could think of no one to turn to for advice now, except Father Jerome. For Tom Nolan had been totally dismissive about Rose, warning Michael that Eurasian girls were always on the lookout for a quick and legitimate passage out of India. You'll be making a right idiot of yourself, he scoffed. Nobody waits seven years in India. Jesus, lad, that's time enough for an entire family to be dead and buried in these climes. And anyway, what's to stop her from latching onto some other gullible sod the minute the rangers get posted out of Nandagiri? Tom had then dug him in the ribs. 
haven't you heard the cavalry regiments cut a dashing figure in their uniforms? She won't wait seven days for you, my lad, when one of those young stallions comes riding by. But I tell you, even the cavalry fellows won't be fools enough to take the likes of her home. When he had protested that the bacon baller would take his daughter back to Ireland himself, Tom had told him straight, you asked me what I thought, and I'll tell it to you as I see it. Assuming she'll wait for you, seven years, Jesus, she'll be an old maid. Haven't you seen what the weather does to women out here in the East? And think of it, man, your children could turn out to be darkies. When blood's diluted, the color will always come through. It wouldn't be fair on the poor things. What would they do back in our clock? You'll have to pick the ones to take and the ones to leave behind. Ask Rose why her mother was in the orphanage. I'll bet you she wasn't white enough to take back home, that's why. And why did Sean, Sean Toomey, the bacon waller, marry her? It was because no white woman worth her salt would have wanted to marry an old Irishman gone native. So the bacon waller goes to the orphanage and picks a girl, a light one as possible, and does her the big favor of marrying her. Color can skip a generation, you know, Michael, so you might get a few nasty surprises along the way. Mm. <laughs> Thanks, Sir, Thank Thank with you. such subtlety and, you know, but it, it really hits home. Um, and I think that's what I love about um, fictional approaches. Um, and I have to just mention now that the book was um, a pick from Sebastian Barry. It was one of the laureate picks, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, oh, oh my God. And he actually said that he wished that he'd written it. I was like, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but you haven't written just historical fiction, so you write like across different genres and, and also kind of between genres as well. Yeah. So what yeah. attracts you to what you write? You know, like, do, is it... Um, you know, do you, do you set out to write in a certain way or, you know, what brings you to a story? Yeah, well, I suppose Paddy Indian, you know, like a lot of people's first books was sort of, you know, based on, on you know, our immediate experiences in Ireland. That was my first book about a young Indian doctor who comes to Ireland uh, and what happens to him. Um, and, and that book, you know, it, you know he, he falls in love with, an, with an, an Irish girl, but it wasn't a love story. It was actually what's happen what happens between him and his mother, mm. you know, because of their relationship. And then my next book was about, uh, it's called The Uncoupling, and it was about uh, a couple in their late 60s, very traditional marriage, you know, an arranged marriage, first time coming out of India, and, and uh, their son hasn't the time to take them around, uh, you know, England. So he mm. sticks them on a coach tour of Europe, uh, and it's what happens to their marriage in those 16 days. Mm. Uh, and, you know, um, the book I'm writing now is also going, it's a completely different book. It's set in Glengariff. And as I was saying to Eve here, it has no Indians in it. <laughs> 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 it's going to be my first Irish book, you know. <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> Yeah, and, and sort of I, I, I'm working ahead as well. I have, uh, I have my next book also in mm -hmm. mind, and I, I'm kind of reading for it, um, yeah. you know, my fifth book. So, um, no, I, I'll write anything, any story that attracts me, I'll go for it. Yeah, I always say that, because um, people often ask me that same question, and I always just say I write like I read, you know, I read really widely, yeah. so why wouldn't I write yeah. widely? And, yeah. You know, and I also hear, and I'm, I mean, it's very clear from your book as well, you know, that... Um, people always trying to put other people in boxes and you don't fit, you know, so yeah, I, I think yeah. that's why I love um, your kind of writing career and, you know, the history of... But you, this one is historical fiction, um, and like I say, it's definitely researched really thoroughly, and you enjoyed the research, but how do you know, you know, um, when you've done enough research and what to leave out, and also, you know, we have creative license, and mm, you changed mm. from the Connacht Rangers to Kildare Rangers, Rangers, so... Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, because it, when I was about two or three chapters in, uh, I realized that, you know, I, I was then big, because the way I write normally, I I'd, I'd do all my research and then leave it, mm -hmm. and then start writing, and then only go back if I needed to check something specific. And then I found, you know, two or three chapters in, that because I, I was writing it as the Connacht Rangers, I was having to check a load of things, mm -hmm. you know, specific things. and. I think most writers have that fear that th there'll always be some reader there who will say, no, the Connacht Rangers wore their pin badge right to left, <laughs> not left to right. Or, you know, the regimental mascot was not a goat, it was a parrot. You know, I mean, but seriously, you know, like yes. there were so many details. And then I said, no, I, ca I can't do this, you know. Mm. And, and also, of course, you know, when you're writing about people, 
you know, every, every regiment has only one colonel, only one chaplain, so you're putting words into, you know, mouths of people who have living, you know, descendants. So I thought, no, I, I better go mm. turn this into a fictional regiment. And because I live in Kildare, I, I, and of course, you know, Kildare is a garrison county. You know, uh, there's so many, it has so many military history connections. So I, I decided to call them the Kildare Rangers and literally just freed me up yeah. entirely. I was able to write what I wanted about anybody, you know, without fear. So Yeah, I did always wonder about that, like whether, you know, the more information you get, the more it can bog you down sometimes. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. It, it, it could, yeah. It, you know, it could. And I, w I was extremely um, wary of putting all my research into the book. Mm. Uh, so I, I, I sort of... Uh, it worked, you yeah. know. I mean, it re it did. It really <laughs> worked. I mean, the the book lost, lost nothing and gained everything Thank by you, you, you know, that freedom. Um, were you scared of the dialogue? I have to because this, like, the dialogue is just incredible. It's flawless, and that's and you're crossing like place and time and class systems, and you know. So you've got the language of like the British Raj, and then you. The second um, or the second section of the book is in the 1980s. So you've also got, you know, the post Raj language yeah, and yeah. beliefs. But then you've got the, the Irish soldiers um, and not being Irish. And you know, I'm obviously not Irish either. Just in case anyone was confused <laughs> about that. Um, but I've set books in Ireland, and my biggest fear was not getting the dialogue right because I was like, everyone will kill me. Um, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. did you like? How did you get it so flawless and so perfect? And did you have any concerns around that? Or? Um, do you know my, my my biggest concern was not the dialogue or anything. My I was very comfortable writing about Irish Catholic soldiers. Yeah. Completely comfortable about writing anything in India. Yeah. My big concern was, did I portray the Anglo-Irish correctly? Okay. Uh, you know, and I I do have a few Anglo-Irish friends, and I I sort of gave them the manuscript and s said. Tell me, if, did I get it right? And um, I had, you know, I was given given the all clear, so that was yeah. a relief. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's funny. Um, that was my big, biggest anxiety, you know. Okay. Yeah. Um, There's always one thing I think when you're writing a book that you just think, oh my word, have I got this right? Yeah. Um, and I can tell that you would not have been worried about a sense of place because, oh my. Just mm -hmm. India just jumps off the page. And I have a bit of an obsession with India. And I'd planned, I was meant to go on a residency in India um, and then go and travel with a friend in India. And then COVID hit. So all those plans went out the window. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I was reading a lot of stuff about India, including your book. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's just it's such a richness and life. Um, but it, you cover so much. You know, you've got the bazaars and the um, train stations. You've got military life, domestic life, mm. all of these, you know, lives of the tainted and various. Yeah. Um, are you familiar with all these places? I am. You know? Yeah, I was very lucky, Elizabeth, because, you know, I, I, my father was in the army. And so oh. I, I have a complete um, sort of, I was brought up in garrison towns, you know. Okay. All my life lived in a garrison town somewhere or the other in India, mm. in several places in India. Uh, but but it, I think like all garrison towns all over the world are almost identical. You know they have a they have a kind of a there's a there's a regimental feel like a, the literary li, literal word regimental feel about a garrison town mm -hmm. um, that's replicated all over. And so you know the army life is in my in my blood. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, I I had an advantage yeah. in in this in the writing of this book that I did not have to, um, you know, all that came just from my own background, you know, my own life. Well, that's so. probably why it feels yeah. so natural, yeah. you know, it really yeah. is natural. Yeah. <laughs> but you have such an affinity as well with um, people and place, like, but also the natural world, you know, the natural world really stands out, you know, like the rare flowers and the view in the second half from the house and, <laughs> yeah. like, does the natural world, like, inform your writing at all or...? Yeah, I actually, you know, I... To familiarize myself with the with that part, the the, the Nilgiri Hills, which which yeah. are an actual which is an actual place, you know, Nilgiri. Yeah. Though the town itself is fictitious, okay. uh, but it's 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 fictitious only in that it's I changed the name. It's actually based on a on a very small garrison town in India called Kunur. Uh, I'm so pleased because I looked it up and I couldn't find it. And yeah. I was like, yeah. <laughs> I can't even Google anymore. Yeah. My skills have got so bad. Yeah. Oh, no. Sorry. <laughs> no. There's a there's a small garrison town in India that's actually like in the in military circles would be very famous uh, because it was a it was a it was a hill station that a lot of people a lot of officers would have wanted to get posted to, mm. you know, because 
f fabulous climate. Uh, so I actually went there and I, I, I was there for about a week and a half. I hired a guide and I, mm. I trekked very, very deep into the forests with him. And uh, in fact, I had very peculiar, one day we were walking through these um, um, very, very dense forests, you know, with sort of overhanging trees, uh, overhanging bushes and wa of wattle. <laughs> Okay. Uh, you know, I think I mentioned it in, in, the, in the book. Um, <laughs> you know, wattle is used to extract, the extract from wattle is used to cure leather. And uh, they're actually like, they look very much like rhododendron. So, you know, you know it can be very dense. And uh, so he was a few, you know, he was maybe a 50 meters ahead. And the sound, you know, there was a sound, a peculiar sound, you know, it's a ringing through the forest. And... After listening, hearing for it, uh, hearing it a couple of times, I, I actually called out to him. I said, "You know, what is that? You know, is that a bird?" And he said, "Oh no, that's a panther." I was like, oh, and you're ahead of me. <laughs> Come back. Yeah. But then he said to me, he said, they, "They are the shyest of shy creatures. I mean, they will literally, you won't, you won't even see them. They're so shy, and you'll, you know." And you just had to trust yeah, that. Yeah, you I had, had to trust no choice. Yeah, so. yeah. But I, I mean, that was, you know, doing that with this man was a revelation, yeah. you know, because it, um, I, and I, I wrote, um, you know, I, I wrote more of the forest into the book mm. than I had planned because of doing that. Oh, I'm know? so pleased yeah. you did. I just, yeah. those bits, which they're just, the whole um, setting throughout is just stunning. It really is just so rich and, you know, but the forest, and I love the natural world and I spend as much time as I can in nature and, um, yeah. I mean, I know you like, because you, you go to Glengariff a yeah, lot, yeah, and yeah, um, yeah. you managed to get Glengariff and Bali Lake in the book, which I was, like, <laughs> really excited about. And I was actually living um, in Glengariff at the time, so I was like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, but the, it was very clear that you had an affinity with these places. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'd like to chat a little bit about Rose, because um, she's mm. a character with so much poise, and, you know, she's really dignified, um, but of course, she's very like you know she's really prejudiced towards mm. natives, mm. and um, she she does occupy this really strange liminal space. Um, yeah. And when you wrote her sections, you switched to diary format. Um, where how did that happen, or was that intentional, or did it happen as Rose arrived? Or? Uh, yeah, it actually happened as Rose arrived. Okay. Um, uh, and y you know, I she's so young; she's mm. only eighteen. And all her prejudices are what she has picked up yeah. and grown up with and hasn't had time to let it go, you know. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, found that I found the diary was a, was a useful tool, you mm. know, to, to set her thoughts into the, into the, into the book. You it know. gives such an intimate portrayal, yeah. you know, but it, it yeah. didn't feel like a tool. It didn't feel like a writer's device. You know how sometimes you can read a book and go... I know why they did that, you know, <laughs> and it's like they just needed to get to there. That was why, and it's very obvious. I shouldn't have you used know. the word tool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Regretting that word, <laughs> no, but it, but you know, but it was it was seamless, and it gave us such, um, you know, a, a really beautiful insight into into her and her personality. Yeah, and of course, the other thing was, you know, um, when I was researching Anglo Indians, uh, I. I I actually read loads and loads of diaries, ah, of uh, course, yeah. you know, in, in archives as well as published, you know, mm. diaries that have, might have been published by, by just individual families mm. that would have published their great grandmothers or, you know, great grand aunts uh, diaries. And uh, Anglo Indians, because they were well educated, you mm. know, wrote a lot. They wrote letters and they, they, and they kept diaries. So it was, sorry, it was actually also because of that, because yeah. they were, uh, I mean, it sounds a very idiotic thing to say, but <laughs> it's a fact that as as differentiated from Indians, they would have been more likely to keep diaries because that would they for them that was you know it was the way young English girls would have yeah. kept diaries and you know it, they were aspiring always to be you know acknowledged as English and this was part of their yeah. uh, you know part of that I suppose you know, longing to be English. You know, and that really comes across, because I, I love that part in the book where she talks about home and he's really surprised to hear that she means Ireland, which mm. is somewhere she's never been, mm. you know, mm. but because um, cause of her parentage, yeah. you know, in her head she is Irish, even though she, you know, and it, so it, they came across, you know, so the diary really helped that yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah, because, I mean, for Anglo-Indian for Anglo people, 
right up to the 70s, you know, going home meant mm -hmm. going to England. Yeah. You know, I, it, it really didn't matter if their, if their uh, paternal line was Irish, Welsh, or Scot. You know, it was, it was England that, that they looked to as home. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's actually, it is, it's quite sad because so many Anglo-Indian families, uh, you know, when they migrated, they migrated in, in batches. And definitely, like, I can tell you for 100% that over, over 60 to 70% of them, the, the first person to migrate from the family uh, to be bought the ticket to go, you know, after, after saving, the first person mm -hmm. to get the ticket would have been the fairest child because they were the ones who had the best chance. And, and once they got there and made, made, you know, made some money, then they would send, send the passage for the next person. And, and it was always by color, yeah. by how fair you were. Yeah. You know? And I mean, you, you'll be amazed because if, you know, I, 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 um, I research a lot of uh, the Anglo-Indian Anglo journals and Anglo-Indian societies, mm -hmm. you know, and, and all their, you know, the various, events that they had and a lot you could you could see that you know in in their in their collections and their archives mm. that that's what happened see you and so many of them sorry so many of them actually hid their hid their anglo indian um, blood and mm. the biggest example of that is cliff richards <laughs> cliff richards was an anglo indian now, like he if he had said to the music industry when he started in the 50s that he was anglo indian sure he would never ever have got a contract no. You Did know. anyone know that? <laughs> no, we're all like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So he was actually born in Calcutta. Yeah, yeah. Oh. So, I mean, and, and he's not the only one. There's so many really big stars, Engelbert Humperdinck, Merle Oberon. They were all Anglo-Indians and who hid their Anglo-Indianness, you know. Mm. And, um, yeah. So, I mean, there's many, 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 many yeah. people. That's, that's um, kind of blown me away. I didn't <laughs> expect that at all. <laughs> so you started out writing a book, you know, thinking about um, a revolt yeah. um, in yeah. India. And then you end up writing this epic story about c class, really, you know, and, uh, you know, you've got the caste systems and all of the, um, you know, the different people. Like, did you intend that at all? Or did, I mean, you can't really... So much of it evolved as I wrote, you know. Yeah. So it, it did... Um, Especially the 80, 80s India, mm. um, you know, I mean, Indian society even to this day is, is ridden with class and caste, yeah. both. And it's such a toxic mix. Mm. Um, it's really, I think, it's held India back. Mm. You know, class and caste mm. combined has held India back. And it's is, so, is holding India back. It's so dark, but then, you know, but then this book is so beautiful and readable, you know, and I think that's like really masterful to be able to do Thank that. You. Thank and there you. was there was a bit in the book um, where one of the characters talks about um, art and politics. Let me just see if I can find it. I've been eaten alive by a fly, by the way, yeah. so <laughs> I'm really trying to ignore it, but <laughs> it's testing me. It's all I can say, so sorry. It's, it's really hard to turn a book while a fly's biting your neck. Um, it's not something I've done before. <laughs> so there was a section where um, he said, you know, in this part of the world, politicians think history can be altered by changing names or removing statues from the places they've stood at for several decades, even centuries, from crossroads and the town hall, from the clock tower, the front of the libraries and civic buildings, as if it would change history or make a difference to who we are. You know, and I think that that really underlies, you know, your book. Can, do you think that art and politics can ever be separated? No, and I don't think they should. Yeah. You know, and um, I, I think at the moment in India, it's such a fearful situation for artists. You know, mm. for, uh, and when I say artists, I mean writers, playwrights, uh, filmmakers. It's a precarious situation because if you, uh, I was actually talking to Joe, who's doing the photography today, and I was saying to him earlier on, you know, that uh, in India, if at the moment if you express any form of criticism of the current government, uh, you're labeled anti-national. And that okay. is so outrageous, uh, you know, that, uh, that you would be labeled anti-national because yeah. any, you know, w any sentiment 
uh, that you express is is because you care for the country. Yeah. Do you know, and surely, uh, whether whether you're right or wrong, you can't be labeled anti-national and then jailed. So mm. you know, I mean, art and politics, you know, should. Well, it's, it's it's a difficult thing to say. I mean, it's, it's easy for me to sit here in Ireland and say, oh, you know, we should oh, we should be mm. uh, more political because you know, if your if your life and livelihood depends on it, y mm. you might be you might be more circumspect about what you say. Mm. Um, and I, and I, I, not my next book, but my fifth book. I'm hoping, you know, I'll be brave enough to write uh, a strong book in that respect. <laughs> you know. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree because I think, you know, all art that we're making is saying something about the way that we view the world mm. and, you know, and, and that is, you know, politics. I'm going to open it to the audience, I think, okay. now. But I have to say, though, I think, um, you know, storytelling is the one of... We're all... Our whole worlds are built on stories, you know, from, from nursery rhymes and fairy tales from when we're young. Mm. Um, and storytelling is a really... Um, complex but beautiful way to, you know, to bring in politics and empathy and all of these things. And this book does it really masterfully. So Thank you. It's stunning. Thank you. So we'll open to the audience. This is where you get to be bitten by a fly <laughs> or have your ear tweaked while you talk. So anyone who would like to volunteer, <laughs> um, it's always hard to be the first and probably even harder now because we're all a lot more visible in this small <laughs> space. So does anyone have anything they'd like to ask? Kaveri. We have a question there. Yeah. Thank you, Mairead. <laughs> Hi, Kaveri. I'm just wondering, why Ireland? You're here 30 odd years. What, what made you settle in Ireland? What was the draw? And what is still the draw? Yeah, I think it's because it's so... Uh, well, we came here because my husband uh, came as a junior doctor, right? And, um, you know, we, we just never went back. Um, <laughs> And I think one of the reasons is because of the similarity, would you believe it, the similarity between between India and Ireland. And and all I can, the way I'd explain it to you is that there's, there's three things, you know. One is both countries so dominated by religion, even though they're different, you know, separate, different religions, but still so dominated by religion. Mm -hmm. So even if you are, you know, a lapsed Catholic or, or a complete, you know, atheist like I am, but I grew up a Hindu. Uh, you know, it's in your psyche. There's some mm -hmm. things that, you know, as a lapsed Catholic or a lapsed Hindu, you will still just, you cannot get rid of, you know, from your psyche. That's the one thing. You know, two countries so dominated by religion. The other thing was, you know, again, two countries so completely consumed by family. Mm -hmm. Do you know, our families are everything in Ireland and in India, do you know? And I think those two things... Um, you know, even the, the whole notion that, you know, your business is everybody else's business, you know. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, we, we felt very much at home in Ireland. Uh, you, know, <laughs> you know, like, like every, you know, like you, you, didn't, you didn't do something because you don't want to make a show of yourself, you know. So it, uh, it's the same in India, you know, what will people say and that kind of stuff. So we felt very, very much at home in India. Yeah. 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 I'm sorry, in Ireland. In Ireland, I beg your pardon. Yeah. That's so funny. <laughs> I'd never have thought of the two being so sort of similar. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, very similar. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. For me, it was a complete shock being from the <laughs> northeast of England. <laughs> Nobody talks to each other, and you all lock your doors, <laughs> and, and everyone's an atheist, and yeah. no one's ever been near a church. And, yeah. Yeah. and then I moved to Skull in West Cork. <laughs> 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 I had my eyes opened completely. <laughs> Any more questions for Kaveri? Yay, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that was gorgeous. I'm loving this interview. Um, <laughs> Thank and, you. and I'm, I'm a big fan of both of you. So I would love to know about your writing process. I'm really interested in that and, and what you need or if you need anything particular in place and how you do it in terms of time wise and assigning things. And I, I, I love how you spoke about research um, as well and how you do that. So I'd love to know more about that. Yeah, well, my re uh, to answer your question in two parts, you know, my research is always very well, um, you know, I, I never uh, sort of, I, I love doing it, so I, um, I'm i quite sort of conscientious and I'd be, I'd do it every day and, you know, I'd, I'd have, uh, I'd be very good about it. But when it comes to writing, I'm a huge procrastinator and it's it's a, it's a affliction that I'm, I'm constantly battling against. 
but I find that if I, if I just force myself to sit down for two or three days and write, and then it just, then it's effortless, then it just comes. But just that, you know, that dancing around the, the whole thing for two or three days before you get, uh, you know, get going. So if I if I had a break for if I've had a break, uh, we're in the process of selling a house. So I've had a, a six week break from writing, and now that whole dance is going to start again. You know, <laughs> so, you know to sort of get back in the zone. And and I, I'm actually uh, so grateful to Ima for having invited me here today because one of the big things is that I'm using today as my kickstart back into writing. Mm. Um, so the pro I, I find I, I don't need to be, in fact, I find, though I, I, I come away to Glengariff to write, it's more for the absolute peace and quiet, but looking out of a window, oh my God, the views are so distracting. I have my desk actually facing a wall. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because otherwise, you know, you could be watching a, you know, a sheep coming down in the far distance and then track it all the way down and the whole day is gone then, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I mean, I, I'm, I, I cannot work if I don't have a deadline because I'm always postponing things. Mm -hmm. So I'm not a great example. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that you said that you were um, a neat freak, which I was so happy because I can't work in chaos at all. Yeah. Like I spend an hour straightening things before Absolutely. I can think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and you have pigs as well, don't you? Uh, yeah, I've, I've actually, I've, I've sort of, I've had to come to terms with. Uh, you know, we're downsizing, uh, we've sold our house and we're downsizing, so oh, no. uh, I think that, that I'd, I've, done my, I've done my last set of pigs, but I absolutely enjoyed being a free-range pig farmer. It was one of the joys of my life. Yeah. Yeah, maybe I'll do it again, I don't know. But. I think I saw a video online um, of Coveri, like, in her shed, a converted garage, yeah. and the desk, and then outside pigs. Oh, it's like, <laughs> that is just the best, I love it. Yeah, so. yeah. free-range pig-keeping if anybody has <laughs> has any grow for it, I'm telling you, it's one of the best things you can do because, mm. you know, the pigs are so happy to be free range, and they're mm. just how. Oh my God, I'm, I'm starting off on a, <laughs> on a rant about. We're pig not keeping. here to talk about books. We're <laughs> no. here to talk about pigs, so that's fine. <laughs> no, but, but it's uh, you know, free range pig keeping is mm. is uh, is is great fun and mm. very little work. Yeah, but it's that like work life balance thing, isn't it? I think the more that you live a life, the more you can. Uh, generate stuff to then create, but you yeah. describe yourself as a slow writer, didn't? Don't yeah, you very normally? slow. For me, uh, and to, uh, to sort of answer your question again, yeah. uh, it is a very slow writer. So if I if I do two pages, so that's just five hundred words a day. I am, I'm, I'm done for the day. I've I've had a good day with five hundred words. Okay. Yeah, yeah, very slow writer. I don't, I've, I've lost all concept of what's slow or fast because I feel like we always end up at the same goal because I'm a really fast writer, yeah. but then, you know, it takes me 24 drafts to get somewhere, yeah, you yeah, know, so yeah. I also say I write fast and dirty, but it's rubbish, you know, <laughs> which is pretty much the truth, you know, whereas you'll be going slow. But I bet you didn't need 24 drafts to no, get there. No, that's true. Yeah, that's true. You know, yeah. so I kind of, so I don't think it's a slow yeah, writer. I, suppose, I think yeah. it's a more, a, a more conscientious writer, perhaps. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> I had a fantastic editor. Oh, my God. I, I have to literally sort of uh, pay homage to her. Her name is Joan Deitch. And uh, long may she live. She's just the most fabulous write, uh, editor. Oh, wow. You know, very, um, very... Um, very compassionate towards every character in the book. Wow. You know, like, I mean, she would write to me, she would write or ring me and say, like, he wouldn't do that. Like, I mean, how could you do that to him? <laughs> and that's what you and, need. You know, yeah. yeah. And, you know, like, uh, you'd, I had to kind of say, Joan, that's it's not fiction. It's <laughs> not real, Joan. <laughs> <laughs> but that's uh, why there's so much, you know, yeah, empathy yeah, dripping off the page. Brilliant editor, yeah. Oh, fantastic. Every writer needs a brilliant editor. Absolutely. Yeah. Do we have any more questions? Hi, thank you. Um, I'm really enjoying the discussion as well. And the first thing that grabbed me when I was looking online is the cover of your book. And I noticed as well the sari that you were wearing in the picture was kind of complementing the cover of the book as well. 
Right. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, the book, I, I, I actually, I must say something about the cover of the book. Yeah. Um, this, the cover was designed by a book designer called James Nunn. And he's, he's really quite an amazing uh, book designer because, you know, he, he read the book and then he started researching, um, uh, looking at, uh, you know, possible connections that he could make for, for, for designing. And he came across, in his research, he came across uh, matchbox labels from the 1920s. And that's actually literally a matchbox label from mm. the 1920s, including the, the typeface. You know, and wow. when I when I first saw the cover, so the only thing he's changed is, you know, the this matchbox la this ma particular label had a woman in a sari, uh, but and didn't have the soldier, you know. But in the 1920s, a lot of matchbox labels had soldiers uh, and animals, especially the ones from India would have had tigers and you know all kinds of lions and you know uh, elephants as well. And when I showed the book cover to my mother and I said, oh you know, ma'am, this, this is going to be the book cover. And she said, my God, that's amazing. Because apparently, I, and I didn't know this, this is the first time she told me this, that she had collected matchbox labels as a child. And she had apparently four albums of them. And <laughs> her father was also, my grandfather was also in the army. And one of the times when they moved, her album collection got lost in the, in the moving. And so I, when, when, she, when she told me that story, I just kind of had a good feeling. Uh, it's you know, stunning. Yeah, yeah. He's, yeah. He's, so, he's such an amazing designer, you know, yeah. such an amazing designer. And the thing with book covers as well, I don't know if everyone, I think everybody notices, obviously everyone here is a big reader, but suddenly a trend will happen and like every cover's blue or every cover goes orange mm -hmm. or like, and you're just like, how am I meant to wade through this sea of orange, you know? And, and it, but this is just, stand yeah. out isn't yeah. it yeah. um it really is it's like it's something i want on my wall can i just can i tack your book to my wall please? <laughs> <laughs> do i have permission <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> any more questions okay well i've got a couple more just um before we okay. just in case and if anyone does have a question please raise your hand because um Otherwise, I'll just keep you here all day. I'm happy to be, you know, attacked by flies and <laughs> sound men. It's absolutely fine. Don't <laughs> so, um, food. Like, the food in the book is just outstanding. There's a lot of... And I have this theory. I do not trust a book that doesn't have food in it. So, you, I can see you mentally calculating, like, do I have a meal in my book? <laughs> I just don't... Because we think about and you know buy and talk about food like me and my husband we've realized when we're eating all we do is talk about food while we're actually eating we talk about other food so you know food takes up a big chunk of our lives you know so i, I just don't trust a food a book that has no food and meals in it because it's not realistic but this is just slathered with food it's amazing like there's food all the way throughout but yeah it's you know what is it about writing about food that you enjoy? Because you, you clearly enjoy writing about it, and it really yeah. brings, you know. So I, I love cooking, Elizabeth. So that that's the first thing. But the the most important thing is that Anglo Indian food, Anglo Indian cuisine is mm. so tasty, and like Anglo Indian women uh, in India are known for being very good cooks. I've never heard of an Anglo-Indian woman who's not an amazing cook. Okay. And I think it's the years of, you know, before fusion food became fashionable, it was years, like, you know, 300 years of fusion, you know, mm. mixing foods um, that that's made Anglo-Indian food so amazing, so mm. absolutely fantastic. And uh, I, I don't know what it is. I, you know, I, food seems to always creep into my books. It's very emotive, isn't yeah, it? And it's, yeah, yeah. And I think you said, you know, how India is like Ireland, where it's all around the family. For family, yeah. You know, and, um, yeah. and a lot of family stuff happens around food, doesn't it? Mm, mm, I discovered mm. after moving here. Absolutely. Because in yeah, England, yeah. none of us talk to each other, and we wouldn't <laughs> dream of eating with each other. So, <laughs> so it was very different. But it does, it's a re you yeah. know, you bring out so much, um, you know, emotion and emotive moments yeah. in the book. It's and stunning. It is actually quite strange, because I, I've, I've noticed... Uh, with that, totally unintentional that any character in any of my books that I like, I'm constantly feeding them. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So that's why Father Jerome, yeah. you know, from the moment he uh, arrives till the moment he <laughs> leaves, you know, he's being fed. You know, he cake. likes his cake. He yeah. likes his cake. You know? <laughs> I have to just say, I had this really embarrassing, awful moment, actually. I was on a residency that was... Um, uh, had the food provided and one night there was kedgeri and there was just lots of people going what's kedgeri what's kedgeri yeah. and I was thinking 
oh god don't let the English person have to explain <laughs> like in Ireland this is not going to be good so nobody knew what Kedri was and in the end I was like it's, it's, you know it's a one of the colonial it you know came out of colonial India kind of thing and someone who's very stalwart went well I guess it was nearly worth it then <laughs> 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 I'll just take my English butt up to bed. <laughs> <laughs> but it was very funny. <laughs> um, I've just got two last questions for you, if, if that's okay with everybody. Does anyone else have a question? No, I think that's about right. Are we about right with time, Ema? Or do you want me to stay here all day? <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. Um, so my, one, my next question is, why did you start the book at a graveyard in a brothel? because <laughs> that's like the best starting point I can think of ever um, but I haven't met you, <laughs> you know? what made it start there? <laughs> yeah because you know for, for, for a young Irish soul for a young Irishman going out to India you know you had uh, you had all kinds of notions they had all kinds of notions but the reality was so different when they hit when they hit India, you know, it was all going to be so exotic and there was going to be peacock feathers and, you know, fancy women belly dancing. Of course, it wasn't like that <laughs> at all, you know. Uh, India was so full of danger yeah. for, for uh, and not danger from animals, I mean, just uh, danger from, from disease, mm -hmm. you know, when they arrived and the heat was just, you know, so uh, that was why I decided to start it that way. Because in a lot of soldiers' diaries and, and letters home, that's what came out, you know, that the reality yeah. was so different from what was promised yeah. or, or, or the notions that they might have had, you know, of the East. Yeah, I, I was shocked. I was expecting peacock feathers too. <laughs> and I got a brothel. No, it was fabulous. It really drew us straight in. And my last question is, um, you know, and I think this is important for every reader, you know, every, every writer I know, it comes from reading. So where did your love of reading come from, you know, when you were younger? Is there a particular book that was, or series, or was there a particular person that just, I don't know, helped to ignite that love yeah, of well, reading? Yeah, my, well, my parents were big readers, and my father was just, like, I mean, he bought books to my mother's despair, because in India, if you buy books and put them on bookshelves, you have to dust them every day, because there's so much of mm -hmm. dust in India. So I'm literally, I'm not exaggerating. Every, if you have bookshelves, they're dusted every day. So every book is taken out and dusted. So my, my mother would despair, but she, she was also a big reader. So she kind of despaired, but actually delighted as well. You know, mm -hmm. so sort of those mad things. So we, we grew up on books. We, every Sunday, we'd be given one rupee and taken to the secondhand bookmark bookstores and just let loose. And we'd come home, we'd come back every week with 10 books because it was so wow. cheap, you know, 10, 10 paisa a book. And so I grew up on a diet of um, Enid Blyton, okay. was how I started. Uh, uh, and, uh, and then there was an Indian comic book series. Not, I wouldn't call them comic, they were picture book stroke comics, you know. Uh, it was called Amar Chitra Katha. So it was all Indian, Indian stories, Indian fables. So that was also part of my growing up years. So mm. read all the time, all the time. And, uh, sort of slavishly followed my my parents' reading um, habits, you know. So whatever my parents read, you know, I would as soon as I was allowed to read them, <laughs> I would read, you know. And then of course, once I've turned about thirteen or fourteen, I was allowed to read anything I wanted. So, yeah, uh, you know, yeah. Well, I'm very uh, definitely my 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 parents would have been my biggest influence for reading. Well, I'm very pleased they gave you those one rupees <laughs> to go and get those books yeah. because if they hadn't done that, we'd have never ended up oh. with such beautiful books <laughs> like this. Thank you so, so much. I appreciate it. Um, so I think um, Kaveri will sign books. But first of all, I'd just like to say, you know, um, thank you for being so generous talking with all of us today um, and ignoring me while I'm no, whipping off my ears <laughs> and doing random things, <laughs> but also for bringing such beautiful books and stories to the world. Yeah. So thank, thank you very you. much. Thanks. Thank you.